Good morning, good afternoon everybody. My name's Steve Young. I'm a director with a company called Winning Pitch. We're a management consultancy that helps businesses grow faster, stronger for longer. We've helped over, up to now, 10,000 businesses grow really fast. What that means for the businesses is that they get more sustainable growth. What that means for our public sector clients is that we generate jobs at a fraction of the cost of other public sector programs. We create investment and we create exports. So just to give you a flavour on that, in Wales at the moment, on our accelerated growth programme in Wales, we're currently creating jobs somewhere in the order of just under £4,000 a job, most of which are high value. For every £4, sorry, for every £1 that Welsh Government put into our programme, we're creating £4 of external investment in those businesses. So our role is to deliver consultancy, workshops like this, to help businesses grow faster. That's what we're about. So let's talk about today. Today, what I'm here to talk to you about is actually uh, winning work via the value proposition. So we've actually got some good news and some bad news. The good news is that what a fantastic event. It's absolutely fantastic to see so many suppliers, small businesses, big businesses talking about innovation, talking about growth. It's not always been like that. About 15 years ago, I was in Birmingham. And if you've been there with me, I was with about 20 MDs of large construction companies. They were there talking about the problem of innovation in construction. And I was there to be the catalyst, to be the fox in the box that does all sort of stuff on innovation. I listened for about an hour and a half as to all the reasons why innovation wasn't working in construction. And it seemed to me quite a sad story the way it was going. So when I was given the opportunity to say, What's it, why, why do you think innovation's not working? You're here to talk about innovation. I looked up and said, gentlemen, as I look around the room, all I see is uh, men of a certain age in navy suits with gray hair, all thinking the same, acting the same, looking the same, probably got the same problem with the short game. Deathly silence there was. So I thought, well, I might as well go for it now. So I said, where are the, cu where are the customers? Where are the technology people? Where are the suppliers? And everybody was shaking their heads. So I thought, well, I've gone for it now. I might as well carry on. So I said, where are the women? Oh, God, no, no women. And then I don't know why. God only knows why I said it. I said, where are the homosexuals? And at the end of the table, a chap put his hand up, an MD of a construction company. I thought, oh my God, this is amazing stuff. We've got somebody coming out at a bloody construction innovation event. And he put his hand up and he said, no word of a lie. He said, I'll tell you where the homosexuals are next time I'm pouring concrete. Which I thought, what a lovely phrase. I said, welcome to your darkness. That is exactly why you got no innovation. And the other guy turned around and said, but Steve, you don't understand. Our industry, we just deal with most of our people, suppliers, our workers, they're just pond life. Fantastic, eh? All I would say is what I've seen today is we've come on a hell of a long way, and that's fantastic. So that's the good news. The other bit of bad news, though, when we talk about businesses growing is that not all businesses grow. 75% of the businesses, and I'm talking everybody from the hairdresser through to big businesses, 75% of businesses in the UK at the moment don't grow above 250K. So we've got an issue with regard to businesses growing in this country. Innovation is at the heart of that. What I'm going to talk to you today about is a technique called the value proposition and how that can really help you. Because when you leave today or this afternoon or my talk or the one afterwards, what you're going to do is have some conversations. And I want those conversations to be winning conversations because it turns out it's really easy to do badly. So let's just talk about that then. So what is a value proposition? We're talking about a value proposition. Basically, it's a way of actually positioning your organization, your products and services, and telling somebody else why they're better and different. Ideally, measurably better and different. So we've got the, your offering, we've got the competitor's offering, and we've got what the customer really needs. And somewhere in the middle of that is an articulation of that. And that could be a sentence, could be a few words, how can that give you an unfair advantage? That can give you an unfair advantage in a number of ways. First of all, it allows you to, if you've got a techie product or a complicated product like graphene, it allows you to talk about that 
in such a way that your customers understand. <laughs> in such a way they don't go, what? I don't understand. Clear articulation. The second thing is it gets you to talk about value rather than price. And the construction industry is always, at the moment, a lot about price, not a lot about value. And that, to me, is kind of the fault of the way the conversations are going. Because if the conversations just are always about a race about price, then it'll always be about price. What a value proposition allows you to do is to shift that conversation away from just price and into value. And in that way, you cease to become just another supplier. You start to become a partner, a development partner, someone who can really add value. When we did this presentation recently at a workshop, somebody said to me, you know, now I've seen the value proposition, what am I going to do differently? I'm not going to have so many discounts because I realize how much value we can really add to the customer. I thought that was quite a good result from my point of view. So we talk about value. And let's just hear this little video about the value proposition. So that gives you a bit of an intro into, uh, into the value proposition and what, what it does. Um, so as I say, we work with a lot of small businesses and big businesses, um, including people like Google, uh, Serco, but also small businesses to make sure that they're really tacking customer pains. What is the job that your business is doing? So I thought I'd do as an example, a live example, if you like, uh, using the Connect organization. Um, what we can see is that, just to give you a flavour then of the uh, value proposition, is at the top we put in the gains. These are the outcomes that we've just talked about, the video showed. Customer jobs down here. What are they trying to do? And the pains. You know, we talk about what's the stone in the shoe issue? Too often, when we see conversations like are going out there, rather than trying to address and understand the pains and the customer jobs, 
people go straight into their sales pitch and start talking about everything their product can do. What we want to do first of all is understand what the customer's problems are, what the customer jobs are. We then go over to the value map, which we just heard about, which is really about talking about, well, what's your product? And mapping that, so these pain relievers to those pains, those gain creators to those gains. And does it fit? If there is no fit, then there's no product. And that's what happens to a lot of those small businesses that I work with, is that the reason why somewhere in the order of about 75% of startup businesses fail within three years, 75% is because there's no market need. Somebody is very passionate about their technology or their new product or whatever it is, but it's not really meeting a need. And that's because nobody's asked the question. So this technique really helps undress that. So here's a quick example. So we talked about the right-hand side. So this is customer jobs. So what customers are we trying to get done in their work lives? So a connect example would be if we just took a plant director at HS2. If we went out there now and said, okay, what is your job? What are your roles? And that job could be social job, could be his functional job, or it could be her other sort of job. So if you just take, for example, this is what happened with a particular technology that's out there at the moment. Talking to the customer. The customer articulated that the jobs and the roles that they did were undertake delivery commitments, deliver on time, keep to budget, build on the firm's reputation. Those were the jobs they wanted to do. When we asked about the problems, customer problems, the risks, the obstacles, they came up with these things. Underground strikes caused by human error. Stress caused by people and problems. Keeping the site safe. Incurring penalties. Meeting challenging environmental standards. Causes of program downtime and disruption. Generating accurate timely management reports. Waste of time, money, etc. So rather than going in head first and talking about the technology, because this organization had this type of technology, this type of technology, this type of technology, we focused on the customer problems. Only when you understand them can you develop a successful product. What were the gains? What, was the, what, what, what sort of benefits were they looking for? So they were, in addition to these pains, they had these gains. They wanted good return investment, great productivity, boost environmental performance, etc. Excellent utilization, strong reputation as an innovator. So these are the sort of things they were after. And we got them to sort of prioritize those. And the technology companies that worked with them actually really went through these and really focused, so they matched those pains and gains. So what does the other side look like? We talk about products and services. So in this case, it was a Leica avoidance zone solution. So what they realized, and only then did they realize, was that what they needed was a number of different technologies to come into this, to play. So a portfolio of different technologies, a mashup of technologies to really address those key pains and those key gains. So what they did was put in things like the pain relievers. So these were producing a product, developing a product, and it's still in prototype at the moment, that does things like, that has technology on board to reduce underground strikes by developing a ground penetrating radar. They produced more machine control in there, such that that reduced the number of um, difficult conversations through more predictable excavating. They eliminate the need for manual strings and pegs because that was a real pain to do. They reduce the delays and penalties, how? Through more precise excavating. So the technology around the precision around the excavating, probably to about five millimeters, had to be in there. And also in terms of, because one of the pains was about monthly reports, what they also put in there was that the telematics would automatically create KPI dashboards. Pulling all this together through a number of different technologies, not just for the sake of it, but because that's what the customer's pains and gains needed. The gain creators, to go with the gains, what did they put on there? Whole range of things, but basically pandering or working to what the gains were they were after. In-cab data, boost the blade accuracy to five millimeters. Act as a billboard to show you're a pioneer of new technology, which was to address the problem that they had about they wanted to be seen as an innovator. View the site in real time to increase utilization of operators. 
so they could save money and increase return investment. Key driver, key driver reduction in accidents as well. So we've got more technology on there. And then what we want to do is this idea of fit. So we know that a successful product or service is only be successful if you fit this with this. If you fit the, the value proposition side with the customer side. So what they are doing at the moment is really looking at, at the prototype of this. And what we can see there is quite, uh, quite a predictable, quite a prescriptive way of saying, okay, these are the features. Why are these the features? Because this one matches with this particular thing. This one matches with this particular thing. So it's really clear that they're mapping what the features of the product are with what the needs of the customer are. And actually, probably, we can prioritize that down further. But deliberately going about trying to map features to needs is a real key difference between the businesses that we're seeing that are winning and those that basically, I know a number of technology companies that go away and think, wow, I've just got a great idea. I'll go and build X, Y, Z. And then I'll get some funding for it. Then I'll do some more development of X, Y, Z. Before they've even actually asked the customer. We had a, a company in um, Wales attracted £400,000 uh, two years ago and they, what they produced was a, a machine that helped optimise the configuration of uh, cyclists, professional cyclists. So they got hundreds and hundreds of thousands of pounds. They took on 32 staff and only after a year and a half did somebody realise that nobody really wanted this product. That can't go on. <laughs> that's, that's, a, that's a whole waste of time, effort, and dreams as far as I'm concerned. So mapping one to the other, but it starts with the customer. Just to give you another quick example, Hilti, a few years ago, faced a growth problem. They weren't growing as fast as they could do. Hilti produced fabulous tools. Some people would say, too fabulous. The problem was that they never broke down, and they looked gorgeous. So why would you buy more? <laughs> They had, to change the, they had to change the growth model. So one of the things that they did was to say, well, I think maybe we know what customers want. They want um, more tools. They want bigger tools, more powerful tools, better looking, more sexier tools. But actually when they talk to the customer, that's not what they wanted. So if we take the Fleet Hilti example here, the, uh, instead of selling to the, the uh, construction workers, they started talking and listening to directors of major, small to medium size, medium size to large size construction companies. It went through their jobs. So what is the job? Well, similar to the one we had before, really. Find and execute contracts, respect deadlines, fleet planning. But what, did, what were the pains that these MDs had? It wasn't about, we need a better looking tool. <laughs> it wasn't about, we need more powerful tools. It was actually theft. It was actually upfront, we don't want upfront investment. What about broken tools? What about delays? What about the stress when we don't have the right tool at the right time? All the penalty charges associated with that. So they talked an awful lot about this issue of right tool at the right place at the right time. What were the gains? They wanted 100% uptime. They wanted access to the newest tools. They wanted predictable costs. They wanted profitable contracts and they wanted safety, so they wanted the latest tools. So that actually drove Hilti to a totally different new model of growth. One that, had they not done this exercise, they wouldn't have been able to get into. So this is the subscription model of tools that they did. So their online fleet management system they brought in was basically a, a subscription service that said, whatever tools you need, we'll supply them to your site. Just pay us an amount every month so we can get you some of these things here. So this was a sound cost management approach which helped address this issue of they didn't want a lot of upfront investment and they wanted profitable contracts and predictable costs. Subscription, every month they paid. But when the, when the tools were either stolen or broken, no cost for repair or replacement, complete transparency on costs. The gains in terms of that were access to a modern fleet of tools and immediate tool replacement. So again, you know, what we can do there is actually say, okay, so the no cost for repair and replacement was the theft. Subscription service gave you the upfront investment and profitable contracts, sound cost management, immediate tool replacement access. So what we're seeing is the successful companies 
making a far greater effort at matching what the customer needs, what their pains are, to what the features are. So what can you do, how can you apply this today? A couple of things about applying this today, I suppose. If you're a tech company or if you're any sort of company, let's just say for the sake of our we're into drones. Drones are very topical at the moment. And I'm sure there's people out there right now saying, going up to stands and going up to people and saying, oh, let me tell you about my drone. And droning on, so to speak. But what are the first questions you should ask if you were in their position and you were selling drones? Shouldn't be about um, our drone is this fast, or would you buy this drone, or this is how much it costs, would you buy it for that? We need to go back to customer pains. So you'd be asking questions like, how do you review your sites? What are your other pains with regard to reviewing sites? The cloud of that, things like, um, not only do we uh, waste a lot of, I think it was the 15% of some of the stuff that's delivered to construction sites ends up in landfill. Also, probably when, I, when I've had these sort of conversations, what we hear is, um, not only do we want to review a construction site, but it'd be really, we really struggle with actually monetizing and, and estimating how much that pile of gravel is costs, or those stones. Is there a way that we could do that? So the key thing here is not about selling. Selling to me, two ears and one mouth. <laughs> you need to use them in that order. So when you're going out there and have conversations, the questions have got to be about, talk to me historically about the problems and issues you have with. Get them to talk because they'll load the bullets for you for you to fire. Other applications, uh, this is an organization that produce a, uh, like a normal weighing scales, but it also has a scanner on. So it can scan your whole body and weigh you at the same time. I mentioned earlier about talking about pains and gains, and one of the things here is this organization used uh, traditional sort of flashcards or a virtual version of it to help customers prioritize which pains or gains or which issues were the highest priority for them because they realized they wanted to do everything. So in, in, interestingly, uh, this thing could actually uh, predict what you were going to, and give you an image of what you were actually going to look like if you carried on eating and not exercising. It could give you a body review. It could give you a time-lapse video. It could track volumes. It could give you actually specific is issues about measurements of your body or muscles or fat. But all these things could have been an interest, but what this business did was use the value proposition, but then followed that up with prioritization. So which of these are more important than others? And in this case, the customers were able to go through the cards and put them in order. Since we talked about value proposition for selling, we also use this with our clients to help them get a, a sales pitch created in a fraction of seconds. So we take something like bits, so we take bits of the value proposition and actually put it into where the gaps are. So for example, unlike competing value proposition, our this is the left-hand side of the box, products or services, helps whatever the customer segment you said, who wants to do these jobs, by, this is the bottom left, pains, and verb increasing, enabling, maximizing, so that's the top of the circle. So how does that work in practice? So for example, with Hilti, it might be our traditional tool suppliers, sorry, unlike traditional tool suppliers, our online subscription tool management system helps CEOs of medium to large construction companies who want to avoid delays and penalty costs by reducing the number of times they discover they don't have the right tool on site and increasing profitability through better on-time delivery. So you can use this tool a number of ways. Yes, to tickle out the stone in the shoe issues, the problems. Yes, prioritization but also it's a good tool to use as well in terms of actually creating the value proposition and testing those. Next stage, if you like, is really about taking that value proposition and then taking it to the next stage of innovation. So we work with a lot of companies on around the issue of uh, minimum viable products. So yes, it's good to have all the customer information, the pains, the gains, etc. But then what we don't want to do is waste time, money, resources, and energy 
still building a product for it still to fail. So what we want to do is produce something what we call a minimum viable product or a prototype, whatever you want to call it. The great news for people like yourself is that there's many different types of ways of doing this now. The internet, iPhone, etc., has transformed the way that people can actually prototype nowadays. So for example, explainer videos. Don't go to the trouble of actually creating something. Nowadays, you can do a quick video. And it's cheap, and I'll show you where Dropbox is in a second, how they did it. But we don't have to go and produce something. Next one is um, an animated PowerPoint or white paper. So again, if we're really sure we've got something, something that's a good idea, get it out through LinkedIn, get it out to some potential customers, and uh, with most of our sort of small companies that we work with, all they're after is a like or a not like or a not bothered. And what they're after is like 80% likes or something like that. But again, we're not going to the trouble of building something at this stage. We're just talking about the pains that we think they've got and the value we can deliver in a white paper with some evidence, maybe a pile of evidence. But good way of actually finding out whether this is something people want enough of. Third area is the traditional sort where you sort of mock something up. So this was a, an electronic um, paintbrush. Uh, for some of these innovative products, there isn't uh, an easy way of doing it. So actually, because the vocabulary isn't there, uh, like wireless was because it was a, a radio without wires, you've got to create something. So actually, you've got to create something sometimes. So this was a bit of a Heath Robinson mock-up so that people could actually feel what it was like to use and get an idea of how it went. Uh, Wizard of Oz, minimum viable product. So these are the people, uh, if there's anybody in the room with online stuff or apps. So a company we were working with uh, were doing an app for, um, if you're a busy executive, the problem, pain of busy executives is not enough time to go shopping, bit lazy with regard to planning the meal, et cetera, et cetera. So they created an app that uh, allowed you to plan your meals and they would deliver it through various providers. But they would do that at the minimum cost by reviewing all the costs of Tesco, Waitrose, et cetera, et cetera. So they produced that. But instead of actually building all the algorithms, instead of going to all the marketing and all the rest of it, what they created was actually an email-based thing that looked a little bit like the app would do. So a bit like in The Wizard of Oz, where everybody thought it was a wonderful technology, and actually it was just some bloke behind a curtain pulling levers. This was basically a just the other side of the app was basically four people emailing or going onto Tesco's website very quickly, looking at what the site was, looking at how much it cost, comparing that with Morrison's or Waitrose, and then emailing something back within 30 minutes. It wasn't the finished article, and you can't scale that operation, but all they would do was testing. Do people want this enough to pay for it? Fifth one we're seeing a lot of at the moment is um, small businesses coming up, creating an animation or some form of video, but then put, putting that straight onto crowdfunding and be crowdfunding platforms to see whether anybody is really interested. And again, we're working with a company at the moment that was um, producing, uh, producing a stroller. Um, and what was interesting there was the, the problem that they were trying to address, or they thought they were trying to address, was the fact that if you go out in the rain with a stroller, um, the baby's covered very nicely, but the poor person who's actually trying to push the stroller gets soaking wet. <laughs> and so what they did was produce something that came out of the stroller and was like a bubble over the head of the person who was pushing it, called Mum's Bubble. So they produced an animation of that, trialed that, and what was interesting, again, you only know when you ask the customers, the biggest pain or feature that they hadn't actually seen was that, and it was mostly females of a certain age who were buying or were looking at this particular product, was the fact that they had fizzy hair syndrome. Now, as a bloke, I don't know much about that, <laughs> but this was a key thing. They thought they were selling a stroller. What they were actually selling was, don't get frizzy hair and have to redo your makeup when you go back. Who knew there was such a thing? They didn't until they asked the customer. But they put uh, Mum's Bubble on there, crowdfunding, and see to what degree investors were interested in it. Could they see there's any line there? Before they did the tooling, before they produced the thing, before. So, Colin. Final one is 3D printed models. And again, we've seen the price just go ridiculously low on this now. If 
few years ago for tooling you'd have had to pay an awful lot to create something like this. Nowadays it's hundreds of pounds and we can actually get it in the hands of people to see test it out. Is it what you wanted? What are the pains about sort of pointers? Is it a case of they're too light? Does it fit in your hand well? Is the button? We can do all this now through 3D printing. So again, a fraction of the cost. But we use that as a way of testing with our customers. So what we're looking for is anything that can be reasonably, uh, that can reasonably stand in for the product, but in such a way that doesn't cost a lot of money, that doesn't take a lot of time. You've been there. This is Facebook. about 12 years ago and Dropbox at that stage was still a very young company. You can tell by the quality of the animation that actually the product wasn't successful by then. What they were after was feedback from customers, try it out, is this of use? Not only technology is it of use, can you work it, is it right for you, but also testing out the value proposition. Think about that video it started off with, and a lot of videos start like this now. They'll start off with a customer. Here is Bob. He's a managing director of a construction company. Bob comes to work and duh, 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 go through problem one, problem two. The problem is that Bob wants to do this, but he also wants to achieve that. And then problem has this, problem, problem, problem. Full stop. Our product, off we go. Dead easy, but many people don't look at that like that way. You look at the videos that are on a lot of people's websites and it's, you know, it's the blah, blah, blah. It's the, oh, we've been in business for 23 years. My name's Bob, I've been blah, 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 blah. Start straight away with bang. What's the problem? What are the problems? We understand the problems. If we can understand the problems, the next stage there, we've talked pretty high level. You might want to take this at some stage down to the next level with the product itself. So get down to how much does, money does this save? What's the percentage time it can gain you? What about in terms of um, dates, etc.? So for example, when we can move over here to start talking about eliminate, decrease, we may be prioritized, we've narrowed it down. The issue here is that then we've got a product or a service that's really helping this person to do their job. And if we can quantify what these organizations want, so for example, we're a management consultancy. It would be really easy for me to blah, blah, blah about our tools, techniques, people, etc. But when I talk to local authorities, 
What I talk to them about is their ability to achieve their economic development plan. What I'll also talk to them about, if they've got it, I'll supply it, but um, what their cost to generate jobs is. So for example, in Leeds, I was there recently, they need to create 16,000 jobs. What I was already talking about was how much it was costing them to create those jobs. So it was about, somewhere in the order of about 29,000 pounds a job for that organisation to generate job creation. I was able to talk to them about our programmes that we run all over the place, and we've got a cost per job of about £4,000. So when you took our price cost per job, times it by the 16000 showed it how much they were doing at the moment, it's a massive, massive value. And then we went on to talk about performance related as well, which really blew the minds a bit. So, getting specific and quantifying Rather than we want to reduce, we want to more profitable projects, or we want to reduce safety hazards by, or we just want to reduce safety hazards, what we want to try and do is get something evidence and something measurable around that. So if you want to reduce accidents by 6%, it's a different product than if you want to reduce accidents by 3%. If you want to increase profitability by 10%, it's going to need a totally different set of value proposition than one that does it by 1%. So quantification here, when you're talking to these customers, get something you can design around. So an example in my world will be, I'll talk to MDs about, oh, I want to grow the business. Okay. So what's your biggest constraint at the moment? What's your problem at the moment? And one person I was having this conversation with last week, he said, um, Communication, okay. So that kind of, my heart sunk there because I can't do anything with communication, it doesn't mean anything to me. So I said, tell me a little bit more what you mean by communication. So he said, uh, communication internal. Okay, still I can't design anything around that. Tell me a little bit more what you mean by internal communication. He said, well, the team meetings, they're just bloody boring and we don't get things done, and people commit to doing actions, they never blah, blah, blah. Ah, right, okay, so it's team meet. I can start to design stuff around that now. Unless I've gone down that questioning technique, I can't quantify it, I can't design something around poor communication. So really what we're saying here is quantification over here allows you to really design value in here. And if we're talking about revolution, not evolution, as we have been doing this morning, then to me what we've got to be doing is really thinking about large amounts of innovation, cost saving, improvements in time, improvements of safety, reduction in, in, in emissions. We can all say those things, but by how much? Because if you're really going to start to revolutionise, you're going to have to get the big numbers and create new ways of doing it. So. Hopefully my aim today was really to talk to you a little bit about how to win more work through value propositions. I think in terms of competitive advantage, it's a way of actually articulating how, what your products or services do in a way that real value, value that the customer can see. We talk to people about what we want to see is I want to see the customer's pupils dilate when I talk about the products we're doing because they go, bloody hell, that's really solving my problem. If only I could have that. We've got companies in Wales that are selling prototypes, selling prototypes because customers are so locked into the needs that they're addressing. I suppose the final slide here on innovation, really, and being unique, it is, I think, the only competitive, that, competitive advantage that we all share, and we're all from different industries, maybe, but the only competitive advantage we really have is the ability to learn faster than our competitors. That's it. If you're going to learn faster than your competitors, then I would say have the right conversations. Talk to your customers and potential customers about their problems and what they need. And if you can do that, I think you can not only be successful, but you can grow your business as well. Okay, thank you very much.